Thank you, Molly. I'm happy to be here with all of you. Um, it is Mind Body Tools, and I was being aware that we've been sitting for almost an hour at least, so I thought we would start with at least a stretch. So uh, if you want to stand up and stretch up, reach up, take a nice breath, stretch in any way it feels good, and then release it. And stretch up one more time. Breathe in and breathe out and release it. And yeah, do it on one foot and then you can shake it out. <laughs> so whatever feels good because um, the body is really important and when it gets tired, it's hard for your brain to uh, think. <laughs> Okay, so when you look at this screen, you see a bunch of funny looking things that look like um, maybe the walnut, <laughs> which is really uh, scans of brains. And what's really interesting in today's techno technological world is that we can actually see into the brain. And why is this useful? Well, we're going to see that for thousands of years, people have doing many practices that they have found helpful, like yoga and meditation. And But what's happened is really the ability to do these brain scans and study the brains of meditators and people doing yoga or people who are depressed or doing drugs, we can see how the brain is affected. So we can see what the benefits are of the things that we do, and also we can see the things that are hurtful. And this is important in the healthcare industry because we really need this scientific evidence. So I want to share with you first a few things on what's been found to be helpful. And it's really interesting that today there's a lot of study about meditation because there's a lot about using meditation to reduce stress and also to reduce pain in the body. And through these studies, they found that it reduces stress, anxiety, and the experience of pain can be lessened and decreased, as well as increasing peace, peacefulness, and uh, well-being. Well, it's really interesting that that through the brain scans, they actually see that it increases what's called gray matter of the brain. And in the human being, there's what we call the prefrontal cortex. So it's not going to be a whole talk about the brain, but these few, my, these few concepts are really helpful because it's, it's the part of us that is what makes us a human being. And so it's our ability to think and to reflect and to plan and to organize and to also be conscious. So it's been found that we get this increased uh, gray matter, which also improves learning and memory. It's also found that it shrinks what's called the amygdala. And this is really important because I think of the amygdala, I always remember it like because it starts with an A and it has to do with the alarm. So when we get scared or under stress, we get that response and you know it signals to like, oh my God, we better do something. And that's the amygdala. But what they found is that in meditation practice that actually the amygdala gets smaller and so the alarm bell actually gets calmed down. Because what's important here is that, that the brain does not know the difference between a real threat and a perceived threat. So we go through life, there are things to, be, to get alarmed about. But you know, when you just think of it, I mean, getting up to do this talk, well, that's a little bit real. But how much we imagine about, oh my god, what's it really going to be like? is not necessarily a real threat. And so it sets off this anxiety kind of reaction. So meditation, they find, helps slow that down. 
And also a new finding is it's really interesting that it helps to promote this very deep calm. And they found this thing called the vagus nerve. And what's really interesting about it is that it goes from the brain actually down into your gut. And so you know when you have that, that sense of like a gut instinct or trust your gut, it's actually like we're trusting our higher, this deeper place inside. And so meditation helps to, to kind of really learn about that. So there's meditation, but not everybody likes to sit. <laughs> And so I wanted to talk about some, a couple of other things that have been found to be really uh, helpful. And um, the arts right now are being explored in terms of their usefulness, in terms of health. And th this is a really interesting study that actually the tango has been found really effective for people with Parkinson's disease. And so it's really interesting because what happens is in doing the tango, it stimulates, actually, it releases dopamine in the brain. And what that does is the dopamine is actually like the thing that is a reward. And so it's like we want to do it over. It makes you want to do something again and again and again. And of course, if you're doing dance and tango, and if you think of someone with Parkinson's, what happens is they don't have the brain message to kind of stimulate it to move. But through the music and the movement and something that gets released in the brain, it becomes much easier. And it's actually like the Mark Morris Dance Company is doing a whole thing with people with uh, Parkinson's. Yeah, so, and then um, if, you're, if, if the 60s are important to you, I wanted to share this, which this is Mickey Hart from The Grateful Dead. And I found this really interesting thing that he, you know, he's a drummer. And he started to team up with neuroscientists because he found that when he played the drums, his grandmother, who, has, uh, who had Alzheimer's, was able to communicate a lot better. And so he became fascinated with, with what is it about rhythm and what is it about this music that kind of changes the brain and helps people. And because I am an expressive arts therapist, I like to share this, that just going to, you know, just looking at art, like going to a museum, spending time in a museum, they have found helps to change the brain, helps to reduce anxiety and stress, and normalize heart rate, blood pressure, and cortisol levels when people are walking around in the museums. And so they have a lot of programs now with people with Alzheimer's and different groups going to museums and providing this kind of programming. But they also found that people who do art, and the kind of work I do is you don't have to be an artist to do, to do art. It's really about expressing yourself and that you can find ways of taking color or you know, finding some image to express something or cutting something out of a collage or even doing gardening or even cooking can do this. But in the... They found that when, when people actually participated in art making, it stimulated, let's see, I'll try this pointer. I can't, let's see, my husband gave me one. Here it is, got another one. Here's another one. You should always have a backup. <laughs> um, it stimulates these two parts of the brain and when they cross, they found that in that stimulation, it actually cultivates much more resilience, psychological resilience and hardiness in people. So uh, just creating, and I think it's because people are relaxing and having their body involved and a lot of movement. So those were the things, so, some examples of what was good in the brain. Yes, do you like the, t the zebra? <laughs> It says, I think it's stress, as he's losing some of his stripes. <laughs> yeah, I saw that and I loved it. So the thing is, stress, a certain amount of stress can be really fine for us. We need it, you know, because a little bit of stress got us all to prepare our talk and hopefully do a good job and things like that. It gets us to, to do stuff. But too much stress and chronic, chronic stress can adversely affect the brain. And in fact, you know, 
we can all think of it because when you feel under stress, suddenly you, you can't remember like where you were going or suddenly you can't find your keys or what I do with my wallet, right? You're all nodding. <laughs> and so, um, because stress affects also this prefrontal cortex that has to do with planning, decision making, organizing, learning, and also remembering things. So you know when you're under stress and you like can't figure out, you just forget things, or you can't find the words and that kind of thing. So anyway, chronic stress affects these different parts of the brain, and you know, like David was saying, it, it the cortisol level, you know, it, it raises, and what happens is it sets up a pathway between what's, this is called the, um, the hippocampus and the amygdala. So, and what happens is that whole thing I was saying about that something is not a real threat, a perceived threat, and it starts to set it up as something real, and so then it triggers it, and you're in the state of, it kind of grows anxiety and, and worry and depression. So, that all doesn't feel so good, right? <laughs> Can you relate to it? Right. All right, so the good news is that there's this word neuroplasticity, which is what David was talking about. And really, the, you know, they talk about the brain being plastic. And when they was, I started to hear about this, I was like, what do they mean the brain is plastic? Like, who, who wants a plastic type of brain, really? But what they mean is it's moldable and it's changeable and that we can learn new things. So what has to happen is that we have to create these new pathways and that it's possible. And so we can create these new pathways through thinking and feeling and new physical sensations. And the, the real key to changing these patterns and these patterns for anxiety and worry and stress is really through the key is awareness. And I like this word pause because we have to like stop for a moment. Because when you stop for a moment, then you can like notice where you are and what's not working or what's hurting your body or what's not working for your food. And then you can make a new choice and do something new. So the compassion is really not to be hard on ourselves about it. It's like what Molly was talking about, love. It's about to be gentle with ourselves and bring some compassion in there. And then the intention is to set a new intention. That just by seeing something to do it differently already helps to change your brain, already helps to set you in motion. Okay, so there's many ways of creating new neural pathways and a lot of mind-body things. So there's you know the meditation and yoga, qigong, dance, exercise, creative arts, journaling, loving kindness, healing touch, and like the massage and some of that body work is really helpful. Hugs, which I'm going to talk about a little later, and nature, connecting with nature, and gratitude, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about, and also sharing with others that we really need the social connection that that's also part of our healing. So I found this, uh, it's called a healthy mind plowder. And I really liked it when I saw it because Dan Siegel is a uh, interpersonal neurobiologist who's like a very prolific writer and speaker these days. And he, he says this, like, just like we need a certain amount of, of minimum daily requirements in terms of vitamins and minerals, we need a certain, uh, these things, seven things every day for a healthy brain and a healthy mind. So what are they? Focus time, which is like some time to have a goal. Play time, having fun. Connecting time, connecting with each other. Physical time for our bodies. Time in, that's reflection time time inside, which actually we're going to do a, I'm going to teach you a little mind-body practice for tuning in. And downtime. They actually find downtime is necessary for our brains 
to restore itself and to relax and regenerate. So even spacing out is good, <laughs> a little bit. If you, if you fit these other six things in. And then sleep time. So all these things, so from, from now you can just begin already to, to take a look at those and see how you're doing in it. And tomorrow, think of how you're going to fit in some of those things that you might be missing. OK, so are you, are you up for doing a little bit of a tune in? Yes. OK. <laughs> so I want to say a, a little bit about the mindful breathing. Because really, today in healthcare, it's a really big thing, mindfulness. And why? I'm going to tell you three things about what's important about it. One is when you breathe in and breathe out and you bring your awareness and attention to your breath coming in your body and moving out of your body, you bring your mind, body, heart, and spirit all together in the present moment. And that also helps the whole brain, body, whole person connection. The second thing is, as soon as you start to bring your attention to your breath, coming in and moving out, you start to regulate your breathing. You don't have to try to regulate your breathing, it just regulates. And then that helps to bring peace and calm inside, which reducing the stress is what helps to keep your brain healthy, okay? It does, it does a fourth thing, which is I'm going to teach this to you about breathing in and breathing out, and then breathing in peace and breathing out calm. And I'm going to say one thing, that as you're doing it, you can notice any thoughts or feelings or sensations and let them pass by like the clouds in the sky. And what that does is that instead of being in something, being in the stress, being in the pain, it helps you notice it. And that's a really healing thing, OK? So as, as uh, Dr. Molly said, I somehow help people relax their shoulders. So you can, you can just uh, find a comfortable way of sitting. And take some nice breaths into your body. And notice your breath as it comes in your body and moves out of your body. And as you breathe, feel the support of the chair that you're sitting on, the floor beneath your feet, and the support of the earth, and your connection with the sky and the heavens above. And so breathing in, I'm aware of breathing in, breathing out, I'm aware of breathing out. Breathing in, I'm aware of breathing in, and breathing out, I'm aware of breathing out. And then breathing in a sense of peace and breathing out calm. Breathing in peace and breathing out calm. And then you can simplify it to in, peace, out, calm. In, peace, outcome. And whatever thoughts are on your mind, just notice them and let them pass by like the clouds in the sky or any feelings or sensations. In peace, outcome. And then just take a moment to notice how that feels in your body or in your mind. And whenever you're ready, you can just be aware of being here in the room and open your eyes when you feel ready and stretch. So that's something you could do any, at any time because we have the breath with us. Our breath is always here, right here. 
And so I, I, I was explaining it to a, a patient the other day, and I was saying, you know, when you just bring your awareness to your breath, and you just do the breathing in, peace, out, calm, it's like you are putting the stick, the, 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 the car thing into neutral. The car thing. What? You like that? The car thing. What, it, what is it? The what? The gear shift. You're, you're putting the gear shift into neutral. And so then it, you're in the pause, right? You're pausing. And then you can choose what you want to do. Okay, so just two more things. And then probably my time is up. So another thing is for people um, is that today we have positive psychology. And it's really interesting because most of psychotherapy for so many years was all about psychopathology, like what's wrong and looking for the disease and really what's wrong. And really positive psychology came about and it looks at what's right and what are the strengths. And that when we focus on the positive kinds of things, it really helps to uplift us. So it's like up, the uplifting emotions. They call it positive emotions, but I have a little hard time with that because I think all emotions are just fine. And it's so, sometimes people think, well, fear and anger then are negative, but actually we need all of them. And it's about being accepting or gentle and friendly to all of them. But focusing on the strengths is really helps reduce the stress and kind of... Uh, feed your, your brain in a good way. So there was a gratitude study, there's many gratitude studies, and after 10 weeks of people writing about gratitude every day, those who wrote about gratitude were more optimistic, felt better about their lives, exercised more, and made less frequent trips to the doctor. So this is also, I, I, so I do, I like to Everyone I work with knows I like to give like real tools that people can do. So this is something you can do. Thanksgiving's coming up. <laughs> and um, then just some other things for connecting, to keep a gratitude journal, to take a moment to focus on the uplifting feelings. Um, you can just put your hand on your heart, actually. You can put your hand on your heart and focus on some, something that you're grateful for while I finish this talk. <laughs> and, uh, and just to notice how that feels. And it's something that actually starts to release what's called this oxytocin, this hormone that's a neurotransmitter in our brain that helps to calm and connect us. Um, and it reduces the stress hormone. So it's the neurochemical basis for the felt sense of connection and belonging. So don't you feel it a little? Yeah. So the other one that does it is uh, hugging. They say like if you hug, you know, a nice safe kind of hug, for 20 seconds it releases this oxytocin. So maybe at the end of the talk or <laughs> Thanksgiving, whenever, just start hugging. <laughs> and, um, and sharing and listening. So I wanted to end with this one quote that comes from uh, Rick Hansen, who wrote this book on the, the practical neuroscience of Buddha's brain, with Rick, Rick Mendias, who's a neurologist in Santa Rosa. And I like this quote, what flows through your mind sculpts your brain. Thus, you can use your mind to change your brain for the better, which will benefit your whole being and every other person's whose life you touch. So thank you very much.